to the Reach to Stars podcast, everybody. Today, my guest is uh, one of my oldest friends. Um, his name is Jay Wexelbaum. He is a writer, a researcher, a political analyst, an expert on history of U.S. companies doing business with Nazi Germany. What? Truth teller, uh, news flinger, <laughs> um, <laughs> pop rock musician, um, opera writer, screenplay writer, all sorts of things, um, and uh, my number one source of news. So um, oh. <laughs> you should totally get up on the Twitter um, of Jay Wexelbaum um, if you want to know what is happening from a well-researched, very thorough source. Um, welcome to the podcast. Good morning. Thank you. Thank you for having me. <laughs> um, so I know I obviously just like put you on blast with your entire history, um, but I was wondering if you want to tell people a little bit more about what exactly it is that you do. Sure. Um, I, um, yeah, I hold a, a PhD in history from American University. Um, my uh, research specialized in American companies that did business with Nazi Germany uh, to highlight issues of business ethics um, and talk about uh, businessmen uh, working with fascists, which I find to be a relevant topic uh, these days. Um <laughs> Um, but then, uh, yeah, yeah, my other interests, uh, I've, uh, I, I know Jana from, uh, from the music scene in Buffalo, New York from many years ago, um, uh, and, uh, been involved in, uh, creative endeavors my, my whole life. Um, and, uh, yeah, yeah. So, okay. So what am I, that's my background. Um, <laughs> Uh, let's see. So yeah, I work on various uh, various projects. I live in Baltimore, Maryland. Um, I uh, I work with the uh, Baltimore Rock Opera Society, uh, working on uh, rock operas, uh, performing and um, writing, uh, music directing, and whatever else um, I can get into. It's a really really wonderful bunch of people uh, there, and. Um, uh, various various kinds of jobs. Uh, the uh, the history profession uh, in higher education has uh, has uh, been suffering uh, in recent years, and uh, so so finding other creative ways to use my skills as a writer and editor. Um, I uh, I do have a kind of a, a side gig. It's not really a gig, just public service, uh, uh, reporting the news um, on social media uh, for friends and family, and. Um, uh, obviously, it doesn't pay well enough to get me a, a new camera, um, <laughs> but uh, but it's join, important. Join his Patreon and get him a new camera. <laughs> yeah, there you go. I do have a I do have a Patreon on my Twitter page. Um, there we go uh, at J J Weixelbaum Twitter. On the Facebook page. Anyway, um, yeah, I, I'm most interested in um, in kind of a, a large scale uh, political developments in American life. Uh, kind of trying to contextualize um, uh, what what's going on. Uh, a little bit like Heather Cox Richardson, who many people follow. Um, and um, uh, yes, yeah, so that's 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 um, fun and stimulating work. Uh, what else am I doing? Um, Currently, I, uh, I work in political communications because uh, the 2020 election is coming up, and I would very much like to see progressive candidates win across the board. Um, and uh, and then I also um, I also wear one other hat as a uh, science writer. Uh, I worked uh, while finishing my dissertation. Uh, I worked for about four years at the National Academy of Sciences uh, because they recently turned 150 years old, uh, writing reports about various scientific endeavors. Uh, so currently, I, uh, I work for the National Institute of Standards and Technology, helping them write reports, at least, uh, at least for the next uh, several months. Um, some big, some big uh, studies coming out, and uh, I want to make sure they uh, are reported with clarity uh, and uh, so that um, uh, the public and stakeholders understand uh, very clearly what the science tells us, because that's important. Exactly. That's what I'm doing right now. Oh, and then, uh, well, there's one other, I can talk about this other project we were just talking about later, uh, the, my brand new project. Um, it's so exciting. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so, like you said, we met years and years ago. Um, I don't even know when it was, 2004, probably. Um, yeah, something like Jay and I were in our first band together. We were in a band for like three days. <laughs> and um, I'm trying to remember what we were called. The bloodthirsty um, vegans. No, before that. Before oh, that, before that? Oh, gosh. Diane and Kurt. Oh, 
Oh my gosh. <gasps> the SS M M F R. <laughs> no, I, I totally right. loved we were guns. Yeah, we were called SS motherfucker. Um, and I we played for like that. three days, but I think we were all a little bit too stoned to continue actually trying to get gigs. <laughs> um, but that's really how, um, I think that we ended up meeting and hanging out in the first place. Um, and I just thought you were really this awesome individual. Um, and at the time you were with your previous partner and y'all were like the cutest thing since sliced bread. I mean, just like the bestest of friends in the entire world. And, um, I can't remember how many years after that it was that you guys moved from Buffalo. Um, but it was about five years, about five years. So it was kind of, you know, we would we'd hang out throughout, um, going to shows and, and, you know, playing on the porch of the housing co-op and all sorts of stuff like that, oh, doing yeah. festival events and, and things like that. Um, and I was wondering if you would talk a little bit about your relationship with the person now known as Lyndon. Um, yeah. They known as yeah. Lyndon. Yeah, Lyndon. Lyndon is my dear friend, uh, and and we are still close. Uh, yeah, we met uh, at a uh, protest planning meeting for uh, the uh, the second Iraq War, which is about to begin. So that would have been early two thousand three, I believe. Um, and um, and just uh, fell into a partnership very quickly, um, and we're very close. Uh, we were married in two thousand five, I believe. Yes getting my dates correct. Um, and not long after that, I went back to school. Um, and then uh, school eventually, uh, undergrad eventually led to graduate school, which is why we moved. We moved to Boston uh, in 2000, fall of 2009. Um, and, uh, and then we were, uh, and then uh, I got into more graduate school uh, at American University, uh, decided to move to Baltimore, um, mostly because another friend of ours in the music scene, Joseph Mulholland, had already moved here uh, uh, to Baltimore and really, really liked it. And DC is far more expensive. Baltimore has a much more vibrant art scene in a lot of ways. And uh, and and I have been here ever since. And, and Lynn and I uh, have been um, here ever since. Um, although uh, around... Uh, 2012, 2013, um, we separated, um, and, and stayed, stayed friends. Uh, we were eventually officially divorced, uh, in, I think 2014. Yes. Um, and, um, and, uh, that was because I had met, uh, my, my current, uh, partner, uh, uh, Sarah, a librarian, um, and she's wonderful. And uh, and then we were married um, in uh, 2017. Yes, 2017. Um, time dilation is, is just <laughs> is uh, <laughs> our sense of time these days. Is uh, and of course I'm a historian. Make sure my dates are correct. So yes, yeah. Sarah and I were married in 2017 and been together ever since. And uh, Linda and I uh, continue to remain friends. Um, uh, I, uh, I I really wanted uh, Lyndon to get involved with the Baltimore Rock Opera Society. Super, super awesome group uh, doing lots of cool creative uh, endeavors. And uh, we, um, well, until pandemic, um, we were uh, working together uh, uh, with a big crew on a very cool rock opera uh, about a dragon queen uh, and uh, her, her uh, priestesses that go on an epic adventure. So uh, really excited to work on, um, on creative projects together. So, so yeah, yeah. Linda and I, uh, remain close. In a situation where a lot of people would have not been able to continue to be friends, let alone be all right with, you know, their, their partner being transgender and like changing from previously, you know, identifying as female to identifying as male and changing their name. And, um, there's a lot of people out there in the world who I think have a hard time wrapping their brain around. Like this person was my wife and now they're my husband. And is that weird? How do you navigate that? And I, I just really thought it was just so wonderful and admirable that, that you were like, you're the person that I have as my, my amazing friend. And I'm, I'm okay with that. And that, I mean, it must not have been easy, but I just, I just thought it was, it was, it was really nice to see you like continue to support them and 
and to just like be on board with that. And I think that's great. Thanks. I mean, I, I won't, I won't gloss over, you know, I mean, it was a major learning curve for me. I, uh, you know, I, we, we all grow up uh, in a, uh, in a sexist, a racist, homophobic and transphobic culture. Yes. And, uh, and it's up to all of us, uh, especially progressives to constantly check our biases and learn and grow. And I made a lot of mistakes, um, over those years. Uh, Lyndon, uh, uh uh, I will let Lyndon tell their side of the story, but Lyndon decided to transition um, while I was in grad school. Um, and, um, and, and that, you know, it really, it really um, put that, uh, put the transgender experience front and center for me. I, I had to learn a lot about that. Um, it was, it was hard uh, for me. I don't think I was always a great partner. You know, in fact, I know I wasn't, um, but uh, I'm, I was also on a uh, on an academic crusade of justice, and I knew that that if I really wanted to be serious about uh, about justice, I had to try to do that as much as I could in my my personal life too. Um, and um, and so yeah, so you know it it was um, it was challenging to talk to family. Um, I, uh, I there's some of my family on my mother's side um, who are. Um, uh, not tolerant. Um, and in fact, in the, in this current political era, we're not speaking, unfortunately. Uh, I wrote an essay about it. Um, mm -hmm. I was supposed to go on CNN and talk about the essay I wrote about, about it. And, and I, uh, I don't know if I would have talked about their response specifically to uh, my relationship with Lyndon, but there, you know, the, the bigotries and just the really radicalization of the right wing, um, people who follow that ideology has been really intense. So that was hard um, I, on my father's side and other side of my family and Lyndon's family. It was, it was really a, a learning experience. I am, I'm fortunate. I'm fortunate that on my father's side, uh, my father is a pretty tolerant guy. Um, he, uh, he passed in January. I'm wearing his hat, uh, uh, you know, as a, as a totem, uh, but he's a very tolerant and good, good guy. And I try to, try to carry that on. Um, but, um, yeah, uh, it, 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 for the family experience, friends experience, um, you know, there's, there's a lot that, that happens when you have a partner in transitions. Um, and I think it's helped me understand at least a little better, um, experiences others have had. Um, and I really try to, uh, I, I just try, I try to share that experience because I feel like that's how people builds cultural competency and, t and, and tolerance. And, and that leads to a better world where, where everybody is, is a, uh, is treated as they should as a, as an equal member of society with value. So. Well, I love that. I'm, I'm grateful that I, that I knew you both and that, um, it ended up being, I think my first official, you know, introduction into knowing somebody who is transgender openly, um, and transitioning and it, it helped me to learn more about it. Um, and just seeing the way that you guys navigated it and that you continue to, you know, have love for each other out in the world. And I just think that's, that's wonderful. Um, so anyway, anyway, for people who are out there who are like, oh, that'd be so weird. I'm like, get on board. Cause <laughs> people are people and you should let people be whoever they want to be. Yeah. I mean, you know, you share your life with somebody and, and you're close and you get married and everything. Like for me, it was like, you can't just, yeah, it's, I don't walk away from that. We, we have, we have experiences we share and, and those are will always be there. And so we're always going to be friends and, and you know, it's, um, that people have decided to, um, to go on, on that path. Like that doesn't, for me, it doesn't change the way I feel. So. Mm -hmm. Okay. So some other things that I wanted to talk to you about, um, were about some research work you did with a certain famous person. And I'm not sure if you're allowed to talk about that or not. <laughs> Are you allowed to talk mm. about your, uh, your uh, famous person, your, your Nazi work with the famous director. Oh gosh. Uh, well, okay. Yeah. No, I'm, I'll talk about it. I'll talk about it. I, I, he may not be happy with what I have to say, but I, I, um, 
so yeah so I mean, I, uh, if he's, if he's listening to my podcast and like when <laughs> right i don't even know if he's like, okay so the the famous person question is a director named oliver stone he won he won academy awards uh, did he win more than one he won in the Probably. 80s early 90s i uh, um he did you know um the Doors, uh, Platoon, Natural Born Killers. Uh, anyway, there is a funny story. Uh, um, I was in the middle of a um, first round of grad school at Boston College, and um, Lyndon's mom called me on the phone and said, Hey, uh, Oliver Stone, famous director, is working on something you're working on. You should call him. I'm like, okay. <laughs> I just check my Rolodex. And, but uh, I got in touch uh, with a history professor he was working with, um, Peter Kuznick who may actually listen to this podcast and see his ears perk up when you mention his name. Uh, and that's fine. Um, and, uh, he's my former advisor. Uh, he, um, uh, I, I got in touch with him and I was working on some, uh, related reports to my field of, um, Americans and Nazis, uh, businessmen and such. And, um, and, uh, we were communicating and really, I just was looking for, uh, some feedback, a leader, uh, to look at some of my stuff, um, some new scholar in the field. And, um, he was communicating with me, uh, through these like threads of all these writers and producers working on this, uh, project, which turned out to be kind of a, a, a multi-part documentary series on, um, American imperialism, uh, business, things that he's very Oliver Stoney kind of like a uh, lefty uh, kind of thing. Um, and um, so I, uh, at the end of that semester, I just, I, I just spammed the group and hit reply to all sent that whole group, my report and uh, Oliver Stone read it. So report about like Swiss banks and Americans. And, um, and he, he has producer contact me and hired me on to, as a consultant on, in my rarefied field. Um, and then if, uh, Peter Kuznick, uh, um, was like, hey, you know, you're a promising scholar. You should be in the PhD program at American University. So that's kind of how I got in there. Um, uh, I, I also graduated with distinction at BC, so that helped. I think um, yeah. I was really, really driven to make a point about Americans and Nazis. Um, uh, I look back on those days and don't know how I did the work I did. Anyway, it doesn't doesn't matter now, but, uh, 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 so, so that led to a very odd job, um, where, you know, I was, I, I, I wrote a few things and consulted and answered questions. Um, and that led to a 10 part series on Showtime, um, to that documentary, Oliver Stone narrated it. I thought his narration was super boring. Sorry, Oliver. Um, it, it, the book was a New York times bestseller, which is great because Oliver Stone's name was on it. Um, Briefly, uh, that's great. Uh, my first citation was actually is in that book. It's actually the Swiss Banks report I wrote. That's cool. It's on my blog. You can read it. It's called The Contradiction of Neutrality. It's about uh, an American who's running a bank called the Bank for International Settlements. Um, there's a very interesting um, archival collection at Harvard Business School from this guy and, and stuff he did in Switzerland during Nazi times when they were laundering lots of stolen gold. So that's really interesting. Um, there's a lot more research to be done there. Um, Anyway, uh, 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 yeah, um, Oliver Stone had a, a particular view, and his, his, what's, what's what the interesting dynamic that happened, and this is something I really want to press upon people listening and, and, who, and the people in question I might be talking about, is that when you get trained, if you're doing it right, when you get trained at the higher levels of, of, uh, of uh, history scholarship, uh, PhD programs, master's programs, um, you get trained to read sources critically. It's very important uh, to, to understand uh, perspectives, people writing, to uh, analyze arguments uh, for uh, uh, what, is, what is the evidence that's backing them up. Are they good arguments? Are they coming from an ideological place? And what you really don't want to do, and I came to this kind of with that torch and a pitchfork, like let's get the corporate bastards, you know? Mm -hmm. But which, if you really, if you really take it seriously, you have to do the research first, and then let it inform your course, your perspective, your ideological perspective. Of course, this is a very imperfect process, <laughs> it's subjective, mm -hmm. but you want to do it as rigorously as possible. We apply scientific methods. That's why they call it social science. Um, it's never going to be perfect, you know, um, but it's what we've got. So um, Oliver Stone doesn't care about that. He has an ideological point of view, as does Kuznick, I think. Um, and uh, they they wanted to kind of build the research around that. And that is 
that's the opposite of really is what serious historians need to do. And there were some big cat fights over various, that's probably a rude thing to say, but there were some, there was some angry exchanges between uh, various historians and, and Oliver Stone, Peter Guznick about their perspectives and their methodology. And I honestly, I really wanted to distance myself uh, and maybe perhaps Peter Guznick has felt that I, um, it did not help that um, I believe Oliver Stone's son worked for Russia Today, that Peter Kuznick was in that now infamous, or right off camera, that now infamous picture with um, Jill Stein meeting with Putin. Uh, Things that now have become very, very important to our discourse of how did Trump get in the White House and did Russia help? And all these all these uh, lefty folks who who seem to be really critical of Hillary Clinton conveniently at a time when there was some uh, exchanges between Russia and the Trump campaign and so on and so forth. And that's really I, I, I was not happy about any of that. And I don't think it's been discussed fully. And uh, yeah, maybe I'm going to get some, get some crap from from people about this, but um, that's my that's my position. This is the first time really speaking publicly about this. Uh, I, I don't I don't think it's okay to uh, to put to um, to put our our <laughs> our world and our nation at risk uh, in that way uh, for for seemingly ideological purposes. I think uh, useful idiots is the term that comes to mind uh, as far as what their relationship with. Uh, with Russia and, and Putin and what happened in the 2016 election. And, uh, and, and so, and I, I, you know, people try to instrumentalize and use my research all the time. And cause Nick is, you know, he wanted to do that too. And, and talks about my research, you know, um, yes. Yeah. American imperialism and American business has helped Nazis and that's why they're bad. And that's why American imperialism is bad. Fine. But uh, for me, it's, just like just like my science report, this, for me, it's really important for us to know what the documents actually tell us, so that if we are going to make an argument about American companies and Nazis, we're doing it from a, an informed place, and we're doing it from a, a you know a, a, a empirically sound place. Um, and of course, I, you know, I'm I'm a progressive person. Like I don't I don't want companies uh, to do business with fascists. I I, I have very strong views about that. Uh, I am anti-fascist. At my core, um, and uh, <laughs> so, uh, and done a lot of a lot of uh, a lot of work around that. So you know, um, yeah, I was I was um, I was ultimately it, it was it was a cool project, but ultimately I'm very frustrated with with the direction um, that um, that Peter and Oliver went uh, in their politics uh, at a moment when they should have shown solidarity with the Democrats and Hillary Clinton because we would not we would be literally, literally living in a different world right now and uh, many in people so many, ways. Uh, many people I have many friends who consider themselves leftists um, I would consider them populists I recently wrote an article about populism which I hope everybody reads um, because progressivism and populism are not the same and there are a lot of populists who think they're progressives and they are not <laughs> and I'll, I'll uh, link to it in the show notes. <laughs> Uh, yeah, yeah. I'll definitely have links to all that stuff. Um, yeah. I was wondering if you can give everybody a super quick little crash course on checking your sources before sharing bullshit on social media, because that is the number one reason that before I'm, I, I try anyway, I'm not the greatest at it, but I try to, your posts on Facebook are like the first posts that show up in my feed every day. And I'm like, okay, this is what's actually happening in the world today. Cause I know that like, you're not just going to randomly share stuff out without really reading behind it. Cause I just, you're a historian. Like, try. You, that's, I, I that's, try. <laughs> the jam is to just be like, eh, share, you know, like yeah. you're going to read I, the whole article and you're going to read like the sources that are linked to the article and then be like, okay, is this beneficial for people to know this? Okay. I'm going to share this out. And Mostly you do these little like kind of summation posts, like, Hey, this is what's happening today. Like check yeah. it out. There's a, you know, a thread on Twitter that's like blown up about this. And like whenever something is kind of like actively happening out in the world, you said be like my number one source of like, pay attention. Something's happening right here. Um, and I, I'm just like really grateful that you could have helped oh. me like sift through the crap to, to see what's actually happening. 
I mean, I feel like, you know, I, I do, I'm doing this, this much work and, and it's, it's imperfect at, at best. Uh, you know, um, I, I have also been guilty of sharing stuff and be like, oh, that was an article from two years ago. Oops. You know, and, um, but, um, but, you know, I, um, and being to Ameri- being married to a librarian really, really helped because librarians are in America are on the forefront uh, and other places um, mm-hmm. of, uh, of information literacy, which is literally a matter of life and death. Now, um, people need to be uh, getting good information, need to be building critical thinking skills to understand the information. Again, it's the same theme here. It's like your, your ideology, your ideology, your worldview does not come first. What comes first is do, do you have good information? And uh, so um, librarians have come up with various systems. My favorite is called the CRAAP test. It's an acronym, C-R-A-A-P. You can look it up. Um, but it basically, it's like a checklist, at least for the basic stuff. Uh, we need to be building critical thinking to look at everything, but it's, uh, you know, checking the date of the article, um, what is the bias of the, of the um, periodical it's in, um, check, um, do the, does the person writing know what they're talking about, um, what purpose is the article for, you know, um, who's paying for, you know, what, uh, who's writing this stuff, you know, and, and these are things you need to ask yourself. And it's not just, it's not just, you know, Oh, CNN has this bias or, you know, uh, Jacobin has this bias or whatever. It's, it's more like every single article you need to do that with every single piece of information. And it's, it's work. And a lot of people want shortcuts and there aren't any, you have to, we have to do that work. Um, and, um, yeah, when we're, especially when we're sharing stuff on social media, you know, it's like, we need to, we need to do that. So I, I, you know, I try, I'm, and I, you know, I'm sharing things selectively, just stuff that's coming across my feed. Some, and some days I don't have bandwidth, some days I have more. Um, and, uh, yeah, you know, I have a particular perspective, you know, I, again, I'm anti-fascist first. That means that any, the largest groups that are doing the greatest amount of good for the greatest amount of people to push back against fascism and, and push progressive causes are usually, is usually what's behind, uh, ideologically, that's my position, what's behind, um, the stuff I'm posting, you know, I, I want the Democratic Party to win. There's lots of criticisms, but uh, considering how dire things are right now, we need to uh, we need the, the kind of World War II level coalition against fascism um, and uh, and put put some of our other uh, niche ideological concerns behind us. Um, that's probably uh, a mean thing to say and call it niche, but it's, it's, you know, like there, there are big stakes, extraordinarily big stakes. So yeah. So sharing, sharing stuff and being, and being uh, mindful of what we're sharing um, is important. Um, I'd like to say one more thing about uh, hope, if you don't mind. Of course, go for it. Um, so there's one other thing about social media sharing that I've been much more conscious about lately as well. Uh, uh, so recently, last few years, uh, because it's so because of the way social media interaction works, it's so easy to get into big fights. And I've been really trying to just straight report stuff with you know no adjectives, no judgmental language. Like here's here's the thing, and you can react to it however you want. And it kind of I think it keeps down some of the some conflicts. But then the other thing I've been doing lately is uh, so I study the Holocaust as part of my research. You know, it's Nazis. It's. I worked at the, at the Holocaust Museum in D.C. at the Center for Advanced Holocaust Studies for a, a little while, um, and um, and one of the things I one of the lessons of the Holocaust uh, that I've learned. Uh, I grew up Jewish, um, so this is this is something it's history I, I take uh, pretty seriously. Is um, is the people that survived the Jews that survived that many of them um, understood hope as a an act of political an act of will, not political, but just a person, personal act of will that, you know, wasn't, it wasn't, uh, oh, this, these lists of facts tell me whether or not I should be hopeful or not. No, it had nothing to do with logic is beyond rationality, to be honest. Um, it's, it's, it was literally, I need to have hope every day because it's literally going to help me survive. And there, you can look, there are studies out there show people with, uh, with more upbeat attitudes, like it literally it helps your body and your health. Mm-hmm. And um, as we know on social media, attitudes, it's not just, your attitude is not self-contained, it's viral. Like if you ha- if you put a cynical attitude out there, that's getting on other people. Uh, and it's usually because people feel scared, they feel bad, they want emotional validation for feeling bad, but like that has a detrimental effect. But 
if you do that with hope and upbeat things, um, and I'm not talking about false hope, happy talk, any of that, but you, you can you can kind of do the opposite. You can kind of help the people around you, your peer groups, family, and friends. Mm-hmm. And, um, and 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 it's and it's for me, it's very conscious what I'm doing. It's very on purpose, uh, conscious. And I and I'm encouraging other people to do that. Um, I encourage people to read the book "I Escape Auschwitz." By Rudolf Verba. If you if you have if you have the bandwidth to do that, this guy, in the main lesson of this book is that he, there was no reason for this guy to have hope. He's he's hearing about Nazi victories in Russia. They're building electric fence around the camp. Everybody's dying around him, and he saw that people who lost hope they just died. Uh, it is such a, a physically challenging environment for a lot of reasons. You could get killed by a Nazi just for looking the wrong way. You could get a disease. Um, but he was like, I am going to have hope on purpose. Doesn't matter what's going on, and and he survived. And was a few people who escape, and and to try to warn people, and and I take I think about that lesson, you know, as as much as I can, um, and and apply that today because you know there's it's a really scary time. There's a lot happening, and and it we can help each other uh, by putting out. So when I do this, so long story short, when I do this reporting, um, that's the other thing on social media. That's the other thing that I'm that I'm uh, cognizant of. Well, sure. I am really appreciative of the efforts that you put out there. Um, and I wish that I could give you more money on Patreon. Um, Cause I know that you want to talk a little bit about your new project. Do you want to do that? Oh, yeah. Uh, so yeah. So sitting at home uh, during the pandemic, I had just been laid off and typically history PhD will write um, uh, a new history PhD will write a little bit about what they've been doing, convert their dissertation to a book or, or so on. And um, uh I mean, many of my peers work on many different things. I work on a pretty dramatic topic, uh, you know, Nazis and, and Wall Street. And I came across a pretty amazing spy story I couldn't really use for my dissertation. And uh, because I've been kind of a running joke for a while um, because of the collapse of the history profession in the United States and higher ed, um, you know, that it might be easier to get a film series greenlit uh, than, uh, than it would to... Um, to get a tenure track position. Um, and so I started seriously considering writing about this spy story and, and put it out there to friends of mine, uh, many, many great, um, um, uh, opportunities to be in the creative industry in, in Baltimore, many of my friends are and film experience and stuff. And I put it out there like, Hey, what if I, what if we did this as a film project? And the response is overwhelming. I have like uh, about a dozen people on a team now, and we are we are doing this. We are writing a screenplay about this incredible spy story. I don't want to talk too much about it. I don't want to give it away. Um, but uh, but there, uh, Nazis, uh, a, a, a Nazi spy on Wall Street is uh, is the current working title. I'm very excited about it. Um, and um, and so uh, so, uh, so yeah, that is. Um, uh, a, a really exciting project that I hope to, uh, you know, provided things, uh, things, yeah, vaccine happens, things get back to normal ish, <laughs> new, a new normal next year. Um, I want to do as much writing. We're writing a uh, screenplay, do as much work as we can while we're sequestered so that we can, uh, we can actually start shooting some teaser footage, uh, for film festivals and, uh, and, and uh, for pitching uh, next year. So, uh, so really, really, really excited about, about this new project. It is so cool. I totally see it like exclusive on Netflix. <laughs> like, <Yeah. you> know, <laughs> it's a, uh, I don't know, eight part mini series or something. I don't know. Yeah. Uh, that's, that's the idea. Yeah. I think that's so cool. Um, okay. So here are the five questions. Okay. Number one, tell me about an experience that shaped who you are today. Wow. Uh, um, well, I guess I'm going to take this opportunity to talk about my dad, uh, who passed away um, unexpectedly um, on New Year's uh, Day. Um, and he was, he's a wonderful guy. Uh, I, I never thought I would be in, in film or my dad was an actor. He's on uh, General Hospital for a decade. Um, he was in various films um, and, and just such a wonderful, tolerant, open-minded, uh, just generous, warm guy. And I know we talk, we, we, you know, he was my dad and I'm biased, but, but when we had a memorial service, it was standing room only. Um, it was just incredible. So he's touched so many people's lives, such a wonderful guy. I'm wearing his hat right now that he wore when he directed. Um, and, uh, he, uh, he did a lot of theater uh, stuff later in life. And, um, 
big influence on me. And so I've been trying to carry him forward, not just from a, from by, by trying to be a role model for warmth and generosity and tolerance is my own imperfect ways. Um, but also, uh, to carry his vision, to carry him forward, uh, to, to, to make up something really cool for, t- uh, uh, television and film, um, because uh, I know he would, uh, he would appreciate that. Oh, that's so, awesome. it's a big influence on me. I was supposed to name five things. Wait, no, there's, no, there's five, five questions. There's five different questions. Okay. Uh, it's kind of like a job interview. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Number two, when you feel defeated or overcome, what do you tell yourself to keep going? Oh boy. That's, that's tough. I mean, um, yeah. Uh, um, that, that, that you have value that, um, that, you matter that people care about you um that um that uh you've you've done you've you've done important things and you're going to do more things um you know i think i think everybody matters um and and everybody can can tell themselves they have value and help pick themselves up and that's that's really that's really hard emotional work to do i mean my um my mom um, has abandoned me, um, and uh, and it's very very hard to feel like you have value when when something like that happens to you. Um, and um, there's a I wrote an essay about it's called Trump stole my mom. Um, you can check it out. Um, but uh, um, and and that's not just self promotion. That's like you can see where I'm coming from and what the struggle. Even with somebody, I mean, I've done a lot of things, but you know, you don't necessarily feel those things, um, and so you have to get into the practice of, of of making sure you're checking in with yourself and 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 knowing that you matter and then you have value and that and that that can help build the momentum to get up and and go forward. I faced a lot of setbacks in my life, um, and uh, and and I've been very fortunate in a lot of ways, but still, you know, so. So yeah, as you get in the practice of telling yourself that you have value is really, really important. Don't, don't take that feedback just externally. It needs to come from inside. So. That's, I'm going I'm to like make a, a compilation video of everyone's answers to each of these questions. <laughs> um, Cause they're all so different. It's, it's just, it's been really interesting hearing what everybody has all these different techniques. I think it's great. Um, number three, tell me about a way that you overcame a failure or a mistake and what you learned from it. I made a lot of mistakes. Um, overcame. Well, yeah, um, I mean, mistakes are the greatest teachers, really. I mean, you know, if you really screw up bad and you, and you, it's, that's the thing you think about, like when you're in the shower or when you're laying in bed at night, it's like, that's, that's, uh, take that opportunity to, to, to learn that lesson. And, that, you know, and, uh, it's, it's funny, you know, you'll think you think you've learned a lot and you're in a good place. And then, you know, it's like five years later, like, Oh gosh, who is that guy? You know, or, uh, <laughs> uh, uh, they have a lot to learn. Um, but, uh, yeah. Um, uh, learning, thinking about thinking about mistakes and what you could have done differently and, and how you could have been better for yourself and for people around you. Um, you know, it, instead of, instead of turning it into a self judgment, you know, I, in my, in my better moments, it's more like, a, um, okay, well, that's when, when that happens again, and I going to do something different. I'm going to pledge to do, to it different, to do it better. So. Yeah. Awesome. Okay. Number four, what one trait or habit is most responsible for keeping you on track? Hmm. This is a uh, challenging one, especially for writers. Uh, uh, you know, I am, and I am very, very, very distractible, and it's very hard, especially these days. It's it's hard to be burned out, get the bandwidth. Um, and what I've noticed is to to do all the really big projects and all the writing and dissertating and uh, things I've done is is do a little bit every day and build that momentum. If you do a little bit. Um, like if writing projects, like some di- I schedule where, when I have a big writing project, do my, the first step is just start, you know, like whether it's a sentence on a page or a word or, you know, because you just keep pushing that. Um, and, uh, and then sometimes the second hardest part is, is to start again the next day and the next day was, you know, 
um, so I'm working, yeah, I've got these, all these two jobs and this project and it's a lot. Um, and this is a very difficult time to be, to, to have motivation to do anything. And, um, but I, I feel like I've, I've done what I, I've done what I need to do. If I pushed each one of those things forward, at least a little bit every day, because momentum, momentum is a thing and stagnation, the opposite of momentum is a thing. And it's like, if you, if you can build that momentum, by just pushing things forward, you can look back like a month, you know, a, a month in the past and be like, I did, if I did something a little bit, if uh, 30 times in 30 days, you did a lot, you know, and, um, and then, and then that you could, that helps to do more. I typically, I mean, not always, but it's really the best I got, you know, it's just keep pushing things forward, even if it's, you know, and, and I break things, I do to-do lists, uh, you know, sometimes, sometimes I'm better and sometimes not, but it's like, it helps me keep track. It's like, I scratch that off, scratch that off to-do list for a day, to-do list for a week, to-do list a month, year. Um, and, uh, I'm like, you know, sometimes just doing the to-do list is that first thing on your to-do list, you know, when you can't get out of bed, you know, it's like, even that can, can help build because momentum's all it's all emotional right it's 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 mm-hmm. a battle uh to you know uh, and there are constraints physical constraints but i mean like that's that's really it so little bits little yeah. bits every day. i mean it's physics right you know an object in, yeah. in motion will remain in motion an object at rest will remain at rest and um i'm pretty sure that's like my entire adult life is just like <laughs> you know like yeah, that. You know i'm always just like oh i can do that let's yeah. add that to the fire like <laughs> I, mean, I feel like I'm, you know, I'm, t- I'm saying, you know, things that many people already know. It's just like, it bears repeating and, and re- we remind ourselves, you know? Yeah. I mean, people may know them, but a lot of times telling yourself something in your head and hearing somebody else say it, um, is totally different. Yeah. You know, Absolutely. so that's what therapists are for, right? Exactly. So, um, yeah. I'm, I'm hopeful that my podcast obviously is not therapy for people, um, but <laughs> that it can be, um, a, a space for inspiration and a space for hope to happen. So I'm really glad that you, you talked about how important that is um, because I think everyone that I have interviewed so far, I mean, obviously everyone has hard times in their lives, but I think everyone has talked about this horrible, hard thing happened to me and then what, and, okay. and talked about what they learned from it and how that has helped to inform their current perspective on the world. And, and I just think that that, ability to learn from, um, and to change your perspective on tough times is, um, the reason that our society can keep going through anything. Um, anyway, <laughs> that was kind of deep. Um, number five, what's the best piece of advice you've ever gotten and what advice would you give to other people? Mm. Oh man. So I, I've had so many great mentors, Peter Kuznick included, still love you. Um, had so many great mentors in my life, uh, scholars, um, uh, creative people that inspire me, gosh. Um, and of course it's easy for me to think about my dad, think about my dad a lot these days. Um, and, uh, you know, the first, I'll just say the first thing that came to my mind is he, my dad would say to me, you know, various trials, uh, in my life, hard times. Um, he would say, you know, Jay, ride the horse in the direction it's going, which is kind of a perfect segue or, or related to the thing we were just talking about is, is, you know, um, you kind of trust your instincts, um, go look at what's happening around you and, and, and push, if you're pushing, if you're pushing against, if you feel like you're constantly pushing against, that's usually a sign that you need to, you need to reevaluate and maybe pivot. Um, and, and, um, you know, um, you know, I mean, there's going with the flow and sometimes, you know, that can take away your agency or, or make you feel like you don't have it. And that's not good, but, um, we, we should really think about where things are going and, and try to be the, the best we can be in, in that context, you know? Um, and so, uh, so ride the horse in the direction it's going, you know, that's, uh, something I, I think about a lot. Um, when I'm, uh, when I feel like I'm tilting at windmills <laughs> in my life. <laughs> that's awesome. So it's, it's just reminding me of something that I definitely want to do with this podcast. So I'm, I'm when, once the first episodes are released, so by the time somebody's watching this, there, there have been several other episodes released, but um, I want to have the listeners slash viewers, because there'll be audio and visual, video of this. Um, I want to have people 
send in what their favorite quote is from each episode. Um, and then whichever one gets the most votes, then we're going to, we're going to make some merch, um, with the quotes and, um, then we'll, we'll split the merch between the podcast and the guests who came up with the idea. So that's, that's the plan. So I, I think that, um, your, your quote is, is definitely up there in my book as my favorite one, <laughs> the horse in the direction it's going. <laughs> so hopefully there'll be like stickers and t-shirts and whatnot that says it like, you know. And uh, we'll we'll see what happens in the future, but I'm I'm excited for um, collaboration and just more things to happen from this. So um, I think that is the end of our podcast for for this morning. Um, thank you, Jay, for for being open and and agreeing to talk to me today um, oh, thank and, you. and sharing so many things. Um, this is just like. I've been wanting to have a podcast for a really long time. So I'm, I'm glad that I can do it and that I finally have a place to um, have all the stories of all these amazing, wonderful people that I know. Um, you so know so I, many amazing people. I know, right? Like it's been a long time coming. Um, so I'm glad that I can, and I can share all these amazing people that I know with the other amazing people that I know who might not already know you. So um, thank you for being on the podcast. Um, check out the show notes for all of the links to all of Jay's amazing work and articles um, back him on Patreon so that he can continue to provide news and research for everybody. Um, and yeah, thanks for listening and watching on the Reach the Stars podcast. We will check y'all next time. <laughs> thanks. Bye. Thank Bye. you. A single interaction has the power to change your life forever. This is a place for the stories of those moments, stories of pursuing dreams, overcoming tragedy and failure, Coming back to life after so much of what feels like dying. Of continuing on with only a vision as a map. This is the place where those moments live on. Come sit by the fire, look up at the stars, and be forever changed too. Thank you for being with us on the Reach the Stars podcast. Our theme music is generously provided by Byro Craddock. You can find him on bandcamp.com. Thank you to all of our current patrons, guests, and everyone else who helps make this dream a reality. We are so proud to be building this amazing community with all of you. If you love this podcast, please consider sharing with a friend, leaving a review on iTunes, and becoming a patron at www.patreon.com slash reach the stars. Don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel to see the videos of these conversations. We'll see you next week. In the meantime, do something cool and tell us about it.